Social Strategy Podcast, Episode 74. Welcome to the Social Strategy Podcast, where it's all about making the most of your business with smart tips on what's working now in social media, online business, and good old-fashioned networking. And now your host, who's also known as Ross PR on Twitter, Vernon Ross. Hey everyone, this is Vernon Ross, and welcome to the Social Strategy Podcast, bringing you the best in online business, social media, and good old-fashioned networking. And guys, I've got a special treat for us today. You know I'm involved a lot in the startup community here in St. Louis, and talking to founders, understanding what they're doing, and helping them with their social media and the strategy behind it, getting together their, their digital footprint, so to say, so that they, when they go in front of those investors, They've got their best foot forward. Some of you guys may not have known that I was that involved with startups, but I do a lot and talk to a lot of people. Well, today, guys, I've got a guy. He Basically, he's known as the pitch whisperer. And what that means, if you guys are familiar with any kind of whisperer, I know everyone's familiar with the dog whisperer and stuff like that. They're the type of people that can help you basically understand the language of pitching your business, pitching your startup, this thing that you've created that you now want people to take their hard money that they've earned and invested and put it into your dreams. And, you know, John is the guy to help you get through that. He successfully helped people raise lots of money for all of their different dreams. And that's really what your startup is. It's your dream coming to life. And John is the guy that's going to help you get there. John, welcome to the podcast. Vernon, it's a pleasure to be with you. I love that concept of helping people make their dreams become a reality. And in order to do that, you have to sell yourself first. And that's what a lot of founders make the mistake when they are pitching investors, thinking, if I can show you how great my idea is, you'll give me money. When in (laughs) fact is, you have to show them how great you are first. Investors tell me on my podcast, The Successful Pitch, we invest in the jockey, not the horse. So your idea, your dream is the horse and you are the jockey. So you have to learn how to pitch yourself first. Why are you uniquely qualified to execute this idea you have? That's the whole hook. Yeah, I love that analogy. <laughs> we invest in the jockey, not the horse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so tell me tell me a little bit about when you say who who the who the founder is, who the startup founder is that they want to really get to know you first and they're more interested in that than your idea. And I know I, I'm sure that goes around the whole aspect of having the, the strong team. Yeah. Just based on experience, but based on personalities and stuff like that. Well, accentuate on that a little bit and talk sure. a little bit more about what that means. Well, I always like to tell a story because that's what people remember. When you pitch, you need to have compelling stories about who you are, what gave you the idea to start this idea, this concept, this startup. Mm -hmm. So the story of origin is always important. One of the investors I interviewed funded Pinterest. And since you love social media, I thought we'd talk about that story. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And he said, you know, they came to us and said, we want to take the behavior of people sticking pictures on their refrigerator and digitize it. And they said, okay, that was a concept for Pinterest originally. And they said, that's interesting. Okay, we'll give you money to do that. And he said, but we're really, we're investing in the team. They had the right concepts, the energy, they worked well together. Um, They had other successful experience that made us feel like they could figure this out, even if it had to pivot. And they launched it and it worked, but guess what? Nobody wanted to do it. And he said, that's the biggest misperception. Most founders, startups are so afraid of their competition when in fact they should be afraid of customer indifference. Mm. So, you know, if one investor said to me, if you're selling dog food, I want to see the dogs eating the food. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> so with Pinterest, they said, okay, what, how can we pivot? And they said, what if we created pin boards where famous people, celebrities, fashion people, sports figures could create a pin board and other people could see it. And once they started that, Then other people say, oh, that's interesting. I want to follow that person's pin board, get inspired by it, and create my own. So even that had to pivot. But they had the right team in place to not give up and figure out how to make it work. Oh, wow. So you were involved in the the early portion of the pitch for Pinterest? Uh, No, no. I interviewed um, a gentleman, Michael Edelhart, at Social Ah, Starts on my podcast. And he was one of the early investors in Pinterest. Oh, very very interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. Now that's that 
that that raises a lot of points from I mean just the um, the being able to pivot and understanding social behaviors mm-hmm. through social media. Yes, exactly. Because you think people are going to want to use it for one thing. In fact, they may or may not, and where they may get there eventually. But even YouTube it was originally the founders of that said, why don't we create a video dating site instead of it just being still photos like Match.com? And they found that people were too self-conscious to create a good video about themselves. But they liked watching videos and creating them, but not about dating. So they scrapped that idea and started YouTube. And, of course, that's a huge hit. (laughs) Right, right. So when you talk about um, understanding and knowing, you know, who you are and – the pivot that you have to take in social media and being able to drop one idea and pick up another one. I think that's perfect, a perfect introduction into how founders are using LinkedIn or not using LinkedIn because they think one thing Mm -hmm. and then it really turns out to be something else. Yes. I'm constantly talking to founders about the importance of having a branded LinkedIn profile, that their LinkedIn profile should be as impressive as the website for their app or whatever it is they're selling. Yes. And they say, oh, John, I don't need that. I'm not looking for a job. And I said, yes, but you're looking for investors. So investors want to go to your LinkedIn profile because if they're investing in the jockey, they want to see your background. They want to see references from previous situations, if you've had any successful exits. They want to see what kind of blogs you're posting, content you're producing that makes you the expert at answering the question, why you are uniquely qualified. And it should match, you know, my Twitter profile, my LinkedIn profile, all of that is branded just like my website. Um, And people, you know, the successful pitch podcast, Shark Tank for your ears, you know, it's consistent. So no matter what social media you're looking me up on, you know that you're at the right place. And so branding is so important and you need to have a really strong LinkedIn profile if you're looking for funding. Mm -hmm. What, What makes a strong LinkedIn profile? Well, certainly taking advantage of all the things that are available, which includes having an, uh, multiple images, you know, not just having your own little headshot with nothing in the background, right? Let's start there. (laughs) Right. Then I think also having uh, reviews for each of the different positions you've had, references, some kind of testimonials. Mm -hmm. That's a, that goes a long way for giving social proof and credibility to investors of, oh, this guy's, you know, not just worked there, but, you know, did it. Right. So those are just some, some top things off the, off the get-go. You can have video content on your LinkedIn profile. I certainly mm-hmm. do. Um, I post my podcast there. Um, I think having regular content that you're producing on LinkedIn, again, gets that content shared and you know in front of the right people. Right now, of course, people are going to go, wait, what does he mean he posts his podcast on LinkedIn? <laughs> <laughs> I post, yes, I post some of the transcripts. Mm -hmm. And then you can click and listen to it from, um, yeah, the best way to do it is just go look at it. (laughs) John John Livesey, you'll see um, every week there's a new podcast that I post from a guest that I had. And um, that keeps, you know, me in front of people by giving them valuable content on what investors are looking for. Yeah, you know, what's I I think what's interesting about that is that a, a lot of startup people that I talk to, they have the most horrible LinkedIn profiles <laughs> because they they just don't think that it matters at all. Right. And because they think, well, I'm never going to look for a job. I don't need that. And if you think, you know, they should also be using it to do due diligence on the investors that they're t- talking to before they get in front of them. Mm-hmm. So if you're really smart, you'll look at an investor's LinkedIn profile in addition to their um, information that they've written, read any of their blogs, see if you have any connections of similar people you might know, places you went to school that are the same, any kind of connection personally, because you have to be authentic and a human being. You can't be a robot when you go in and pitch. So if you really want to impress an investor, not only do your homework on who they are, but take a look at who else they've invested in, call those founders up and say, hey, what's it like when Vernon gives you money? Does he give you money and connections and advice? And then when you meet the investor, you can say, you know, I talked to your uh, founders that you funded, Sue and Bob, and they can't say enough good things about you. And I'm so excited to, you know, get to know you because I think that's what I'm looking for, not just money. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, you know, guys, when you look at John's profile, you're going to see a great example 
of what to do with a LinkedIn profile. Yeah, I think if people look at an example of a good one, mm-hmm. and I looked at other people's and modeled mine after that. So, Very cool. Yeah, but, but using video on LinkedIn, you would think that would be a no-brainer. A lot of people aren't aware that they can do it. Right. Yeah. Or embed video into a post, which, Mm -hmm. you know, the, um, using the, the LinkedIn pulse as, as a second blog or even as a first blog, to be honest, right. It's it's something that's effective. And guys, when you go out to John's LinkedIn profile and you check it out, notice how the artwork is customized for LinkedIn features him and the guest. It's a, it's nice branding about that particular episode and the episode's right there. So when you go to that post, you're going to be able to listen to it, look at it all right there. You'd never actually have to leave LinkedIn, no. which is a smart thing to do. So if you're looking for, you know, how do I do this on LinkedIn? Just use John's profile as an example. Mm-hmm. I do the same thing on mine. So it is wonderful. And actually, guys, I was slipping. I had not sent John a LinkedIn request <laughs> ah, which is something that I normally would have done like just right off the bat. But I, you know, I, it's just one of those things that happens. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. So John, you know, you, you share a story and I, I, you know, I think you do it really well. What's one of the, um, what's one of the stories that you have about how you first got it, got started in this, in this area of expertise and funding and actually getting people money for their businesses. Well, I used to work at Condé Nast, and my last position there was in the executive director of corporate sales, packaging all 22 brands, Wired, GQ, Vanity Fair, W, Vogue, et cetera, um, for big advertisers like Lexus and Guess. And they also asked me to find startups that they could either use to help monetize the brand or possibly invest in or buy. And so I was having startups come and pitch me. One example was a company called Hall Stars. H-A-U-L, a shoppable video player that allowed people to watch a video and buy the clothes, which was perfect for the fashion brands at Condé Nast. And so when he came in to pitch that, he was talking about how it worked and that it was time-stamped. He didn't explain the problem he was solving, and he confused people. And they said, we're going to pass. And I said, let me work with them. And so I said, look, we've got to narrow this down. The problem is nobody's clicking on a, a static banner ad. The solution is you create a video that people are going to watch and not only click on, but buy the clothes right from the video. That's the solution. Nobody cares how it works. So we went back in, and the pricing was much more uh, simplified. It wasn't confusing because what I found is the confused mind always says no, and they won't even tell you why they're confused. Right. So once we had that honed, then they said, okay, you can go pitch that to a denim company, and they sold $50,000 worth of denim in three days. So they had proof of concept, and it was off and running. And I just realized that only 1% of pitches get funded, and I know why now. So that's the problem I'm solving and helping people craft a compelling and concise pitch that's easy to understand. And then from interviewing investors on my podcast, Judy Robert and I have a program called Crack the Funding Code where we help people get pitch ready and get them in the right room. Right. No, that's interesting. So do you think that when you're when you're talking about pitching mm-hmm. and something that I think is is possibly um, something that parallels with that is is social media and how you communicate over social media. Mm-hmm. I think one of the, the biggest problems that I see and one of the problems that I see when I talk to clients is that they don't have a clear and concise message about what it is that they're offering. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's all over the place. Yeah, it's uh, it, if you need one investor told me on the podcast when I interviewed him, he said, so many people come in here, they're trying to boil the ocean. Said, <laughs> what a great concept. Just boil a cup of water. You know, everybody forgets that Amazon used to just sell books, prove that concept, was known for it, and then started selling everything else. Don't try to do everything. Just low hanging fruit. What's the biggest problem you're solving? Show proof of concept, product market fit, however you want to call it, and why you're the right person to do it, that there's a big market and that the investor is going to get a return on their investment within three to five years. Those are the things they want to see. They do not want to see a product demonstration for five or 10 minutes because they're not a customer. They're interested in very different things than a potential sale. So the sales deck has to be very different than the pitch deck. Oh, wow. I've not heard anyone say that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sales decks is where you talk about 
you know, here's how the product works and here's the problem and here's the solution. Uh, but investors are not so concerned with that again because they're investing in the jockey, not the horse. So they, you know, they might a couple of one slide with some screenshots of how a mobile app works is more than enough. They're more interested in how big is the problem, how big is the market, what's your competition, what's your barrier to entry to competition, who's on your team, those kinds of things. Very different topics and content than a sales deck. No, that's that's really interesting. So when you start talking about you know, podcasters and one of the biggest issues for podcasters, and you'll know this from running a show, is sponsorship and and mm-hmm. funding for a podcast. Mm-hmm. Do you think that some of the things that you teach for pitching and actually how to present your, your company to get investment is the same thing that podcasters should be thinking about and listening to for pitching themselves to potential sponsors? Yes. The more concise you can be on who you help and what problem you have are solving for that person, whether you're pitching for funding, pitching for a customer, pitching for advertising sponsorship, the better off you'll be. So if you're saying, I have a podcast that I help tech CEOs who are struggling with their investor pitch to become irresistible so they can get funded fast. That's my one sentence pitch. Who I help? Tech CEOs. Problem I'm solving? They're struggling with their investor pitch. What happens? They get funded fast and their business takes off. Now that means I'm going to target people who want to reach startup funders, banks, lawyers, you know, who wants to be hired once a startup gets funded, once you start targeting that and tech in particular. So if you're a lawyer that specializes in helping tech startups with their patents, then that would be the perfect sponsor for my particular podcast. See what I'm saying? How specific it is? Right, right. No, that's that's gold. So guys, go back and listen to that three or four times so that you understand <laughs> what he just said. Because that that in itself, uh, we should probably charge for this episode. Just just <laughs> that one line sentence that was really good because it's it makes you think that you're probably not doing that when you talk about sponsorship. Because John, I actually I teach a, a couple of sponsorship courses and. I, I was, you know, had my start back in the video game industry with, you know, event sponsorship. And mm-hmm. so that's along the same lines of, you know, what I tell people. And to be honest, guys, that that one line sentence says a whole lot <laughs> that you can find in a two hour webinar. But mm-hmm. but just okay. that, you know, identifying, you know, who you help, how you solve their problem and then how you can help that sponsor. That's 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 good stuff, John. I really appreciate that. Well, the more you connect the dots for potential investors or potential sponsors, the easier it is for them to answer, oh, will this work for me? Mm-hmm. Oh, this is you're not just pitching any investor. You want my money and my connections, and do I fit into your culture? And the same thing for a sponsor. They have a brand image, so you need to know what your brand image is and that you show there's an affinity. You know, We both stand for integrity. We're both passionate about what we do, right? The people who are shopping here want to shop there. One of my favorite sponsorship examples, I love co-branding. A few years ago, Lexus co-branded with Coach Luggage. Mm. And they had a Coach edition of the car, and they put the Coach uh, leather inside this car. And then when you would buy that car, you would get Coach Luggage in your trunk as the gift with purchase. And they had a Yeah, and they had a commercial showing the Lexus driving down Rodeo Drive in front of the Coach store. And they said, now going Coach means first class, right? So it's elevating Lexus. It's elevating coach to the mindset of first class. You're on Rodeo drive. They were competing against BMW and Mercedes. So they had to do something to really, you know, establish the brand as prestigious. Right. No, that's, that's really interesting and brings up a lot to mind when you start talking about maybe there is a way, you know, as a podcast or as an author even, or as a coach that you can co-brand with another brand to help elevate, what you're presenting to your potential clients and also what they're presenting to their potential customers. Well, back in the day before Starbucks was in every corner, um, they would fly from city to city and check out potential locations. And one of them was on a flight from Seattle going someplace on United airlines. And they heard the flight attendants apologizing for the quality of the coffee. And they said, what if we got United to serve Starbucks on the plane before we even opened up a Starbucks in that city, then people would have sampled our coffee, 
be more likely to come into the Starbucks, and United would have a unique advantage over American. So it was a win-win for United and Starbucks to do that. Oh, wow. I didn't know that story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, those co-branding things are all out there. Yeah, it's yeah really, they are. Mm-hmm. It's important to figure out. But you, before you can even do that, you have to know who you are as a brand and what you stand for. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you have some really interesting guests on your podcast, and um, I see a consistent theme with the stuff that you talk about and how you talk about it. And, you know, it's it's the same message over and over again, said a lot of different ways, but I think that the one theme is that you have to be clear and concise about what your brand is and understanding who you are and who you help. Yes. I hear so many investors tell me sometimes people come in and they talk for 10 minutes and we don't have a clue what they're doing. And I remember Judy Robin saying she judged a pitching contest once and a doctor was going on and on and on. And they finally, she asked him a couple of questions. She's like, Oh my God, you fix holes in the heart. That's what you do. We don't know. We don't need to know all the medical terms. Just say that. We... <laughs> oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So you're not there to impress people with how smart you are and use a bunch of acronyms. And, and God forbid, do not read the words on your pitch deck. That's boring to death. You know, you have to come up with a story that grabs the heartstrings and pulls hard. Would right. you like to hear one? Yeah. You know, what's funny is... um I podcast movement was this uh, this past weekend in, uh, in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And um, did you go? Because I didn't get a chance to see you there. No, but I was just uh, interviewed um, by Donald Kelly, who was the MC oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Donald. Yeah, and um, the sales evangelist. Yes, and Jessica Rhodes. I work with her, and my right. friend Harry Duran, who edits my podcast for me. So yes, I knew a lot of people there. Oh, awesome! I didn't. I did not realize that you were a full cast member. Hmm. Yeah, awesome thing that Harry put together. He's uh, Harry's a good guy. We're really good friends. So mm-hmm. we know a lot of the same very, very good people. <laughs> yes, it's a small world, right? Well, there's a good point to your network is everything. It's all about, you know, you got to be consistent and be known for one thing, right? What's your one thing that you want people to know about you so they can send you referrals? Right, exactly. Exactly. You know, I was I was actually going somewhere with that, and I, I don't recall where I was going, but I'll, I'll go in this direction <laughs> instead. Okay. So when I was at Podcast Movement, I was talking to a few podcasters, and we were talking about the whole thing of, of funding because it was a it was a big theme there. There was a um, there was a panel session with Blog Talk Radio and a few of the other I think um, the guys that bought out uh, Stitcher Radio. I'm trying to remember who that is. But they bought Stitcher, and they were talking about funding. They were talking about these huge shows, these you know big shows like the Joe Rogan Show and the Mark Marin, you know WTF podcast and Serial. And there's a bunch of small podcasters in the room trying to understand how does this apply to us and what problem are you solving for us because we still don't understand. How in the heck do we make money with our podcast? <laughs> so, yeah, I think it, it's just one of those things. It, it goes back to that theme of um, your panel's great, and it helps to have this understanding of this big picture funding solution that you guys can provide. But what about the small show? What about the, mm-hmm. you know, the guy's got 500 listeners and he's not going to get, you know, a John Lee Dumas type deal He's going to get, right. no, thank you. I'm sorry. Your show's too small. What about that guy? And, you know, mm-hmm. in um, giving compliments to blog talk radio, although I don't use them, they, they did finally, the CEO finally responded with, Hey, I think our network's probably perfect for you <laughs> because we do deal with smaller shows and, you know, maybe we could help you. I don't know if they could or not, but it just, you know, in, in retrospect, thinking about podcast movement, I'm like, wow, there were a few sessions where the people were not identifying the problem that they solved, especially on some, you know, on the panels and stuff like that. So that, that was really interesting that you, you brought that subject up. Well, it's a consistent issue, right? No matter what you're talking about, you have to be a good storyteller. Plato said storytellers rule the world. People remember your stories, not your numbers. My favorite story is working with a guy named Martin who needed some help with his confidence when he was pitching. And I had him stack his moments of certainty, times in his life when he knew he nailed it, right? And you want to remember all those things before you get in front of a group of investors so you're really confident. And his story was that he grew up in the Netherlands, but he's originally from South America. 
And when he turned 18, his parents took him back to South America, dropped him off naked in the Amazon jungle to survive for two weeks because in his culture, that's the rite of passage into manhood. Oh, my God. I said, guess what? That gives me goosebumps, Martin. What did you learn in the Amazon jungle? Well, I learned how to focus and pivot and persevere. I said, great. You're going to take those lessons from the Amazon jungle to the concrete jungle of being an entrepreneur. And when he had that honed in practice, he won a pitch contest because investors say, hey, I'm going to put my money in the guy who survived the Amazon jungle because he'll be able to go overcome any problems that happen in the startup. Right. That's the power of a good story. So that's why my mission is to help people become good storytellers so that they get what they need to make those dreams come true and be memorable. Man, that is that is awesome. And I think, Martin, I, I'm sorry, John. I, see, I'm even into the story. I'm calling you. I know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think, John, that is probably the perfect note to end it on. When people want to find you online, where can they best locate you? Well, I will give a free PDF of the three mistakes to avoid when you're pitching if you text the word funding to 66866. And my website is John Livesey, L I V is in Victor, E S A Y dot com. And the podcast is The Successful Pitch. Awesome. All of that, guys, is going to be in the show notes. So it'll make it very easy for you to be able to find. And I'm going to have that text number prominently right underneath John's picture so you guys can get that because I, that is a valuable piece of information. So thank you so much for offering that to the audience. I'm sure people are really going to get a lot out of that. And it's, again, it is three mistakes to avoid when pitching investors. Is that what the PDF is? That's what it is. Yes. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I'm going to be looking forward to reading that one myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Vernon. It's been a pleasure. Hey John, it's been wonderful, man. I really do appreciate you coming on the podcast. So I hope you had a pen and a pad. You needed to take notes on that one. If you didn't, definitely go back, take notes. John dropped some real value bombs there and some stuff that, I mean, you're if you're looking for funding, if you have a startup, you definitely should be checking out what John is saying. So I wanted to touch on a couple things real quick. First off, podcast movement was amazing. Just got back from podcast movement last week, still on cloud nine, going to stay there on cloud nine because there's just a lot of things that I learned and a lot of connections I was able to make and strengthen old connections and make some new ones and make some new friends and see all my FinCon people that I love seeing all the time anyway. So this was a really good conference. I learned a lot, was able to do a lot, and I started some early promotions on the book. So you guys know that I'm writing a book, but what you didn't know, because this is the first time I'm actually publicly announcing it, I got a book deal. Through relationships that I was able to build over over the course of time, number one, by going to conferences, this book deal would not be possible if I was not attending conferences and reaching out to people and then maintaining those relationships, not as a tactic to be able to get anything, but just because these are really good people that I've met and that I want to be friends with. And so once you meet somebody in real life and you're friends with them online, it becomes a solid relationship. And I really love that part about podcasting and about social media and about just being involved in conferences and things outside of, you know, your normal everyday life because it takes you out of your comfort zone and it surrounds you with people that you're going to want to meet and that you want to be connected to. Sometimes they can be more influential than you are or, or not. They, they could just be at the same level you are. You could be helping them. But the point is to get out there, reach out and make those connections. Anyway, the book is going to be coming out soon. I am super excited about it. The name of the book is called Master Your Message. It's how to find your voice in meetings, on video, behind the mic, on stage, and in real life, too. So many lessons in this book. Uh, I've got a couple of people that are contributing to the book. Chris Brogan, multiple New York Times bestselling author, author of eight books. He has contributed a story to the book. Patrice Washington, you'll know her from previous episodes. She's the only person who's been on the podcast that is considered a co-host because she's been on more than three episodes. So Patrice is in the book. She's uh, just recently been published by Harper Collins, although she has several books out that are all bestsellers. She's on the Steve Harvey Morning Show. She's the voice of the Steve Harvey Morning Show, the financial voice of the Steve Harvey Morning Show. She's been on this television program, and Patrice is just a rock star. I'm so glad she was able to contribute a story to the book that you guys have never heard before, even though she's been on the podcast three times. And finally, but not least, uh, Matthew Turner, Turned Off Millionaire. You guys, this this guy, has he was a, a light for me right at one of my darkest periods of trying to write. 
and almost given up. And he just had some really kind words to say and helped me figure out that everything was going to be all right with this process just from a writer's perspective because he's written successfully a lot of books. And he has a new one out currently that I'm honored to be in as one of the entrepreneurs that he featured who shared their story. It's called The Successful Mistake. There is going to be a link to it on the site and in the show notes. So definitely check that out and pick up a copy of it on Amazon. It um, it will really honor me if you guys could grab Matthew's book. He's put a lot of work into it, a couple of years of getting this book done and uh, over 100 and in 50 interviews in the book. So it's, it is an amazing work that he's done. And it's not just transcripts of interviews. This is a lot of work, a lot of editing, a lot of reflection on building really good stories about success and the mistakes that people have made that have helped them to become successful. It's amazing work. And I'm so glad that Matthew is contributing to the book. The book's going to be out soon, as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, publisher is Morgan James Publishing. I'm super excited about it. They've got a great reputation, and I cannot wait to get this book out on the market. It's going to be in Barnes & Nobles, Books A Million, anywhere books are sold. We're going to be working on getting that book there in addition to Amazon. So that's one of the advantages of going with a traditional publisher versus just self-publishing is that you can get your book in bookstores and that part to me is just amazing. Makes the entire process worth it. Woo! That was a, that was just great, great news. I was so excited about that. So anyway, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Make sure you check out the uh, VernonRoss.com forward slash friends. Check out all the friends that I have in the podcast. That is one of the ways that I support the podcast. So Podbean, Spreaker, uh, Telestream for ScreenFlow. All of the things that I find valuable are on that resources page, and they are things that I use. So definitely make sure to check those out. Uh, and, of course, it helps fit it for the podcast and help keeps things going. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I really do appreciate you tuning in. Make sure you connect with me on social media, at Ross PR, pretty much everywhere, Twitter, at Ross PR, Instagram, at Ross PR, and, of course, on Snapchat, at Ross PR. Looking forward to seeing you guys online, and I will see you in the next episode.